Hey, welcome everyone to uh, uh, the Cut the Crap Conversations. Um, uh, it's really great to have you all here. Um, before we kick off and talk about the uh, column that last came up and focus on health inequality, let's get to know each other a bit. Um, so can we do a check-in? I'll introduce each of you, as I can see on my screen. Uh, your challenge is to uh, introduce yourself without mentioning your job title um, and say why you're here and how you're feeling. OK, introduce yourself without mentioning a job title, say why you're here and how you're feeling today. Um, so can I start with you, Neil? Sure, uh, I'll try and keep this one brief. Um, so uh, my name is Neil McDonald. Um, I'm an artist, activist. Um, uh, I run a number of civic uh, nonprofit organizations um, all geared towards, uh, I guess, system change. Um, without saying kind of what I do, I mean, there's essentially kind of um, a, a number of organizations that kind of work kind of collectively across uh, different sectors. Um, and essentially they all act, um, or they all kind of work either as a commons or within common commoning principles. Um, so very much about kind of um, engagement of people and collective authorship and things like that. I see there. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> That's great. Lovely to hear from you. Um, Ruth. Hi, um, I'm really interested in the fact that we seem to be in, live in a society that's very unhappy and very unjust in lots of different ways. And I'm, I'm really interested in what we can do to change that across any range of issues, health, housing, finance, relationships, well-being um, and I'm here because I'm tired of too many meetings where people say one thing and do another or they, they're not honest they're not genuine and and so I'm kind of drawn to the people who seem to want to cut through <laughs> the crap and and get to some actions thanks Ruth uh, Johnny Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Johnny Denis uh, from Sunny Lewis uh, in East Sussex, uh, not far from you, Bob, apparently. Um, <laughs> and um, I've, um, I've, over the decades, I've supported and started and founded a number of community enterprise type things, tackling uh, anything from inequalities in food to inequalities in housing. Um, all sorts of bits and bobs up really. Um, I'm downplaying it a little because I'm actually I'm trying to reframe where I am right now because my career has turned a corner and I'm now in a position to rethink my direction about how do I support other organizations in an ongoing way um, to do the thing they want to do. I actually think that change, you know, I, I'm, I used to think about changing the world and I think I could do that one step removed, helping other people to change the world um, a lot better. Um, and so I've got a bit of a background in some of that, and uh, but I'm also doing that alongside, uh, without naming any job titles, uh, the, the fact that I was um, I was able to uh, I've started to be able to make a difference in the the community in which I live by being um, by by be, having a significant role in the local council and actually making changes for people um, and actually implementing making things better. So I I, I see this as a dual hatted approach to life <laughs> from inside the system and outside very much outside the system and trying to bring them together for for uh, maximum you know synergy between those two lots of energy there you go lovely thank you johnny um joe took me all unawares hi everybody um i'm jojo i'm from sunny devon and it is sunny at the moment believe it or not it's very beautiful um we're creative placemakers, so we help communities find creative ways to celebrate their place. So in other words, we're trying to change the world one street at a time. That's our technique. Um, as, as, a, as an individual, I, I got drawn into um, new thinking, new power thinking, new economy thinking through Charles Eisenstein and GIFT. So we are... Um, our street activity happens using gift in a very circular economy. 
And that led me on and I met Neil yesterday. We were in the same um, Francesca Pick um, uh, Stir to Action webinar on new organisational structure. So, so that I'm, I'm learning my way through that. And I think we're dancing a dance towards horizontal um, structure and uh, um, self-management. But we're particular as artists, we're particularly impassioned about people being able to bring their own the whole selves into work, which is something in my long work history I've very rarely been able to do. And now that I can build this organization from ground up, um, I'm very passionate about that and many other aspects of this. I'm very interested to hear your nitty-gritty problems and really get in there. Yeah. Let's get in there. <laughs> Brilliant, Joe. Thank you. Um, Vicky. Hello. So I wasn't expecting you to come to me. Um, I am not a community leader and I have the greatest respect for all of you that are. Um, no, I, I guess my role is helping socially responsible brands be more successful. So I'm not so much at the coalface, sadly, um, but I, yeah, I love working with, with all the great movements and organisations that are um, through a lot of marketing and brand work and comms. So that's me. Um, why am I here today? Because I love working with Bob and Practical Governance and Stir to Action and yeah, really, really interested to hear what all of you have to say today. Nice one, thanks, Vicky. Uh, Peter. Uh, thanks. So I'm Peter. Oh, look, I'm Peter Flatback on that. Um, I'm Peter McFadden in other and other um, moments. I'm in a personal journey of going back to the future because I fell off a ladder about five weeks ago now and broke a bit of my back. So if I end up either putting my screen off or disappearing, that's because lying like sitting like this becomes increasingly uncomfortable. But anyway. Um, yeah, as well as so the back to the future bit is trying to actually take the time and go okay because people keep telling me about all these wonderful opportunities there are because I won't be able to do all the things that I was doing and can't and I'm trying to be positive about that and rebuild and do well do more of the things I should be doing um whether I've, I'm still spending a lot of my time um involved in talking to councils people who, in, who are running local level councils and also uh, people who want to run pirate uh, event, piratey sort of ways of getting into local democracy at grassroots level, which I've spent the last decade doing, which I don't think is a job title, is it really? Anyway, I'll be... let you off. I'll let you off, Peter. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to go uh, and jump in. I, I'm here because I am. I, um, uh, I really struggle with this whole community leadership thing in the sense of. I spend half the time thinking, oh, my God, we need more people just to step up and do stuff and take things forward and got to act, get, get going, move, move mountains. And, and, and on the other hand, um, you know, I then sort of struggle with, oh, no, but we need to be alongside and we need to not be kind of driving things forward too much. And, we need, and, and I wrestle with this sort of um, uh, challenge constantly as to where I'm supposed to be. And it, sometimes it keeps me up at night. Um, and also I kind of worry that there are lots of things that aren't talked about which we need to address if we if we really do believe in kind of community-led change in asset-based work that uh, we don't talk about like can this have an effect on a whole system can this can we really realistically change the world in this image or are we just you know playing around the edges and, and so I wrestle with that stuff and so I'm basically uh, have gone a long route to getting a little support group to help me wrestle, you know, share that load. So thank you to everybody here for, for being a part of that for me. Um, Abby, would you like to go next? Hi. Um, so similar to Vicky, actually, I wouldn't say I'm on the in, at the coal face of community leadership. I've been working with Start to Action. Um, my husband, Johnny, and I set it up a long time ago, it feels like, but um, Johnny's really been the the community leader i would say in our organization and i recently um joined to be able to support him um mostly with communications and um sort of administrative stuff and prom 
production and stuff. However, I find um, my dad was a community leader as well. And I, I've always been interested in um, how much individuals put themselves into it almost to the um, sometimes sort of to the detriment of their own physical and emotional health as individuals. So, cause, and I, I find that sort of um, an incredible thing to watch and experience. And also how, again, I guess, Bob, like you were just talking about how you get people, more people around to support you whilst you're also trying to kind of, you know, change a lot of things around in the community. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I'm particularly interested in, um, is young people and how we nurture um, more community leadership. Um, and I think that perhaps the definition is completely different for young people. What does community leadership for young people mean? Um, so yeah, that's sort of, those are the two things that interest me. And I'm here today because I'm really excited about this column and this partnership and meeting all of you guys to hear what you've got to say, so yeah. Awesome, thanks Abby. Uh, Suzanne? Hi, I'm Zana and I'm based up in Scotland. I read some of your articles and got really curious. I am part of an artist collective in Edinburgh um, where I have a leadership function, but equally my work is quite similar to that. And a lot of it is around placemaking, space making, how places and spaces are for everyone and how we can achieve that by using assets and strength rather than a deficit approach. And I'm here today because I spent a lot of time in my bubble with fellow practitioners. And sometimes it's really helpful to step out of that bubble and hear other people's perspectives in other areas, in other um, projects. And I felt this could be an opportunity to exchange with others around in the country. Thank you. Nice one. Great. All right, there's already some connections being made between you, Ruth and Suzanne now, which is good. I encourage that as always. Um, the Ian just messaged me to say he had an urgent thing. He's coming straight back. Um, uh, I couldn't really say no because it was to do with the bevy and I'm on the committee there. So I had to kind of go, <laughs> all right then. <laughs> um, what I've decided to think I'm going to do to kick us off is before we go into slightly smaller groups, I might send you off into sort of two groups or even two or three. So I think you get quite rich conversation then before bringing back. But I wanted to send, based on the column that, that I posted up earlier, a few little sort of provocations of things I took. I've got like four little statements that just get us into a chat. Um, uh, and hopefully that can start to bring out whatever people want to kind of get off their chest. Um, so I'm going to, uh, rather than do the screen again, uh, on the slides I'll just post it into the chat the first one of the four um, and ask someone just to kind of see what their reaction to it so I'll read it uh, this pandem pandemic will force us to finally value and properly invest in the role of community in addressing health inequality that was a, a thing that's in there is that what do you people feel about that will it or Johnny then Ruth yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the pandemic isn't going to force anybody to do anything, uh, and it's uh, so there's uh, uh, in my in my humble opinion uh, that uh, there's there's been amazing um, there's been amazing community response all over the place everywhere. I've never heard I've not heard of anywhere where there isn't a community doing some great shit. Uh, just you know, there's totally amazing things. That doesn't mean that anybody's being forced to do anything anywhere, um, and it doesn't mean that the community is now seen as the backbone of you know of societal you know. Uh, taking society forward, although of course it is, um, but it not not from the policymakers' perspective. They just, you know, they they will not be, you know, they will see the community as an adjunct to things that they think are important, um, uh, and they won't see the absolutely instrumental nature. And I don't think there's anything. Uh, so I'm just looking. I'm focusing on that word force particularly, um, and uh, and there's no, that is that just ain't going to happen. However, there are people that do recognize the role of community. And I think that's, uh, the, the, especially those that have, uh, so we, we got COVID 
uh, before lockdown, first before lockdown one, the, we're now in the sequel, and uh, the so we we got it, and then we came out of that into well, we we were in isolation when lockdown happened, and then so we it was a bit like twenty eight days later, turning up and the streets are empty and going what the hell's happened, and uh, but we we benefited from residents helping out, giving us food, doing dropping off food parcels, and and you know literally and the, and and as that was happening, there were all these umbrella movements ha uh, of of community um, mutual aid groups that were cropping up and they were they were happening at higher and higher levels so that they were building on the building blocks of local neighborhood community uh, district wide and the you know and the and the, the amazing nature in which our council uh, joined with those groups and fed up and fed in and 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 um, it, it was like a really really good synergy but it, but other councils next door weren't like that uh, and so, you know, it, it was still a shit show. And so it's, it can be done. People can recognize and can work collaboratively and differently, but it isn't, there's nothing gonna make that happen other than the people involved. That's me. Thanks, Johnny. I wanna build on that. Um, I... Go on, Joe, you go and then I'll respond to Neil. Yeah, go on, Joe. Yeah, sorry, I'm like, what did I cut in? No, no, not at all. It's Neil's just posted something in the chat, which maybe I'll just introduce because he said, could you briefly talk on what you mean by, by health inequality? Um, I was really drawing from the article, uh, Neil, and, and what was really kind of drawing is that there are huge disparities in, in health outcomes across different communities. And there's a great deal of inequality uh, in terms of access to health care and also in health outcomes. And so it was it was talking about building on the column there. Does, does that answer your question sufficiently? But, but, but you might have more expertise. I'm not a, a particularly around health inequality. You know, you might you might be able to add some of your own flavor to that rather than my sort of definition. So sure, I'll, I'll 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 think about that, but maybe uh, Joe, you, you go ahead. Uh, but thanks, thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Thank, thank. Yeah, I just had a little reflection about local authorities picking up on what Johnny was saying there about one local authority acting in one way, and it not being reflected in another. In Devon, we recently had a big regenerate Devon um, or virtual conference around donor economics. And it was incredibly well attended, I think over 800 participants and lots of individuals from uh, both officers and uh, councillors from local authorities um, from all across the southwest. And so there are individuals, that's our experience of it as well, there are individuals inside local authorities who truly want to do things differently. Um, we've been talking to, in fact, we've actually um, recently recruited as a as a volunteer expert uh, an officer from Devon um, County Council who's particularly passionate about health inequality and about the fact that um, uh, this top-down direction that's uh, still rife in um, local authorities makes it so difficult for him to find real answers at the messy end of health provision. And, um, and so he's really, really passionate about that. So he's joined us as a volunteer to give us time to look at that kind of thing, particularly looking at impact assessment. And that's that's one of the those nutty things that I'd like to get in. How can I be sure that what we're doing is actually helping? But yeah, just a reflection on um, local authorities and working alongside local authorities. There are individuals and maybe that will be a groundswell there'll be more of them and, and change will happen from inside. In the meantime, I don't know how to tackle the problem that Johnny described. I mean, can I, yes, Ruth, go on. Sorry, Bob, you were gonna, is it okay? I, I just, you know, you, you, you come at these things and you've got a particular angle and then you see something written differently and your mind kind of a little bit, well, mind does occasionally explodes. But for me, that statement, you know, this pandem pandemic will force us to finally value and properly invest the role of community in addressing health inequality. I, I think what I've seen and I'm seeing is communities are emerging as, as kind of trying to help, trying to help across, you know, all kinds of issues. But I think they're like two strands that aren't, I, I don't see those strands being brought together in any real way. You know, the health inequalities in this country are dreadful. They're so profound. 
you know, and in the pandemic, the, the death rates, where, who's dying, where they're dying, and in what circumstances they're dying. You know, that feels to me almost a reinforcement of those inequalities. And I'm really not trying to downplay the value and importance of community, but I don't see those two strands really being recognised, valued, brought together. I don't see anything being forced to happen. And, you know, as we see what's going to happen with um, the vaccines and things, even the danger is this is actually just reinforces it. We're not, we're not doing anything to unite those strands. Can I ask a question? Somebody can kind of come in on that as well. But one of the things I was going to raise is that who is the us and the we in the, in that statement and in what you just said, Ruth? I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on that, but um, who will force us to finally value and, and we aren't making the connection in the strands? Who, who do you feel like the us and the we are in that? Yes, go on, Neil. Um, I can't believe Dan's he's reading it. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, I think, at least, but from my from my kind of um, experience over over this over this year uh, and, the, and the pandemic, is that um, many people who are kind of falling outside of the system um, are, are being left to kind of uh, struggle for themselves. But I have also seen um, kind of those same people, um, you know, at essentially innovating in the way that they kind of work together to be able to bring something that's really quite. Uh, valuable uh, to um, to the front, and and they have to, you know, kind of innovation is is bred out of necessity, you know, um, and um, and so there've been like quite a few initiatives uh, that that either I've been part of or have kind of been happening that I've been aware of, um, one way one way or another, that um, have gained a lot of momentum and have been a really necessary thing to support lots of people, um, you know, whether it be kind of um, you know, fresh food kind of uh, uh, delivery, for example, um, from companies who are just kind of completely pivoted around what what they're doing, um, uh, or uh, you know, kind of collective kind of support to create kind of uh, renters' unions and things like that. And the thing is that it, although it does really empower us uh, as members of those communities, and it raises a lot of awareness, um, I, I guess I, I have difficulty in. Um, or at least I try to acknowledge that, that essentially, as as we kind of progress along, authorities or um, organisations who are just hoping things get back to you know, the status quo of what things were before, will then dismiss that value that's been kind of uh, created in the kind of surge of necessity, um, and try and get back to uh, the, the way things were before very quickly. Um, without recognising that there is kind of so much value there, I, I think that that that. that the raising of awareness is one of the most important things. Um, so in, in terms of kind of like the, the us, then I think it's very much like the kind of collective us, but then <laughs> there's, a, there's a second us, which is with if authorities try and get back to the status quo because that's what they know and it's stable and secure as far as a system kind of is concerned. But all these kind of efforts that, that we're all then making to kind of take advances and be autonomous in, in, in our actions, um, it's very easy to kind of burn out when uh, you have kind of a, a top end kind of or top down kind of system coming back in, even if it's supporting. That it's easy to kind of undermine all that stuff that's happened beforehand, or even not even acknowledge or or know that it was there. Thanks, Neil. I'm going to, Peter, come in. Thanks. I was just going to going to say, well, that the us is clearly not central government in my mind. And then in a sense, if the, if, if the phrase was this pandemic, this pandemic um, you know, offers extraordinary opportunities to finally value the property you know, uh, and properly invest. So, so I think what, it, from what I think it's done as it, ha it has brought out and reinvigorated and created all sorts of wonderful things, they are there. As Neil quite rightly says, what, what happens next is the key bit. And I see you know, the, the drive to push for um, uh, for a return to, to normal, the normal that didn't work, uh, being that's the, that's the challenge, you know, how we stop that from happening. Um, 
And what Johnny was saying about local councils, you know, some absolutely, some have been fantastic and some have been uh, quite extraordinarily crap. I mean, they've just simply done nothing, just simply said, it's not our job to, you know, it's like, what? How, ca how can you do nothing at this moment? You know, what, you've got reserves. What have you done? You know, what were those reserves for? Anyway, so there's a huge variety. So some, some people have, have taken, sometimes the us has involved, uh, certainly at a local level, has, has been really exceptional and interesting. Um, I, I fear it's definitely not central government, for, but then I've, I've had 10 years of being cynical about localism, so. <laughs> I think you're not the only one, Peter. Uh, Su Suzanne. What Neil just said really resonated with me and it made me think about, we talked about something in our local, um, basically a movement as well, about, well, will there be some force after what we've built up to continue this with the help of a local authority? And what we were talking about, and I don't know if this resonates with anyone, was we are looking at a way how we could instigate a conversation to ask our local authority partners that we're already talking to and really say, can we take a breath and review this kind of scaffolding that you could provide for what we've been doing to continue? Because we don't think we can force them, but we hope that we can have a, yeah, a scaffolding conversation and say, you know, we really want to build two levels of scaffolding now are you willing to do that? And if so, how? And what budget is there? So just at that moment, can I just do, Neil, I've seen your hand, I'll come back to you, I promise. Um, uh, Ian, you're back. Do you want to just uh, say uh, hello, do your little introduction to everyone else so that you'll, we can bring you in and then um, uh, I'll go back to, to Neil to build on what Susanna said. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Uh, so I'm Ian and I live in Brighton. Uh, I sort of regard myself as a sort of refugee from capitalism. I kind of tried it for myself. It didn't really work. It, well, just, I wasn't very good at it, but it also didn't make me very excited. Uh, whereas community business and uh, community action did make me excited and sort of saved me from despair, I guess. Um, I'm a food obsessive, so I tend to think in food terms of almost everything I'd, I'd quite like to be eating now. Um, I'm uh, an oversharer and sort of not very good at politics, so I uh, I tend to blurt out stuff and uh, get really annoyed when people go, oh, "Oh, you're not meant to say that to those people. You have to you have to play a game." It really pisses me off. You can't just say what you want and just be forgiven for it if it doesn't suit people. Um, so yeah, I, I'm also I've said this before in other forums. I, I'm in it for the money. Uh, so I, I want to get paid. I don't like volunteering my time to do all this unless I really, really want to. Otherwise, if I'm doing stuff that uh, kind of merits payment and, and is making things better, and there's a way of paying me, I, I quite like getting paid. So, um, yeah, that's me. Uh, in terms of, yeah, local authorities, I've had some dealings recently with local authorities in terms of a new start and stuff that we can do. And uh, just, just the thing that we get back most of all, I don't think this is probably um, just Brighton that does this, is uh, we haven't got any money. We haven't got any money, we haven't got any money. So it's always, it almost seems like if you bring them ready-made solutions, they might consider them, which again is really fucking frustrating because just they're in the way most of the time, but they have these big chunks of things called buildings and land that they, they have seem to have no ability to see the power that they have when they have those things so they just seem frightened and i don't blame them they've been treated like shit for a long time but there is also complete lack of imagination complete lack of vision everything goes too slowly by the time you've bloody got somewhere something else has come up to make it more difficult so it's hard work but um you gotta keep doing it haven't you? thanks uh, yeah thanks for your honesty as well i'm just gonna uh, uh because we were going in that direction anyway. This was one of the other provocations, and I'll come to you, Neil. It was it was a thing that came out in that phrase too, which was about our role as community leaders, possibly. Um, we were talking there, a light is being shined. It's our role to keep it shining and make the case. Is that 
true um you know is that part of what we were talking about is it our role to keep making the case and keep developing it that's something i want to throw in the mix but neil i know you've been waiting patiently apologies um, you wanted to build on what on what um had just gone before yeah um and and uh, i think uh, also it builds touch on things that ian, ian suggested and, and just mentioned as well um and um so i i uh, just to give a little context um uh, so yeah so the organizations that i uh, start and, and run uh, do so without without any funding <clears throat> uh, at all. So they're all, all nonprofits, and they they kind of try to create kind of ecosystems um, where you kind of recognise a need and you address it by not just kind of waiting to uh, hoping that a council or someone else who should be doing it does it because it probably will never happen, um, but by figuring out another way to fund it within your own kind of organisation. And um, and so it is really really important to work with with your authorities whether it be local or, or regional, or whatever, um, to continually inform. Um, uh, but in, in them terms of kind of say, asking them to, to kind of put up another layer of scaffolding to, to do things like, um, to touch on what Ian kind of said as well, which was that uh, there's a lack of imagination. And, and I, don't, I don't necessarily see it as a lack of imagination, but I think, you know, I've seen so many people go and work as council officers who go in very excited and kind of active and really just really wanting to make change and make, make a difference and then being slowed down so much in procurement and so many so many different issues which stop them from actually completing a task in the first place um, or even kind of taking up your idea in the first place and, and doing it and, and I think it's, a, it's our responsibility to continue to shine a light on it but I think it's also our responsibility to not only go to them and tell them some solutions but then also be able to enact them ourselves um and create kind of those systems to be able to to do so without going and begging for money um one of one of the the things i've become very frustratingly aware of over the past years is um uh as uh, um i won a, a council tender to take on a council asset a few years ago and and when i take leases for example i uh, to, to uh, run community buildings um some of which have like asset community value kind of um listings and things as well is I, I'll, I'll take like a week or a couple of weeks and I'll kind of do all the things, all the stuff myself. And yeah, I've, I've become good enough at law as a non-lawyer to be able to kind of know, know, know what I'm talking about. But then with, with this one tender that we, we won, it took two and a half years to come uh, around. And that was because um, the council decided to kind of uh, reuse their buildings in a positive way and therefore give a discount, which was a very tiny discount, I may add. Um, but because they were doing that and therefore they were using public money to reimburse that discount, they had to go through this entire procurement exercise and everything needs to be signed off both by Hackney and then by the BLA. And it was a mess. So it took another two and a half years and cost us around £150,000 when I just uh, a few months ago found a, found a, a site which um, was owned by the local authority. They didn't even realize they owned it in the first place anyway so i had to go to them and say do you know you own this um and can i have it and I'm, I'm not asking for any money i'm not asking for a discount or anything i just want you to hurry the, hurry the hell up and just just give it to me quickly um, um I, got, I got the keys for it just just the other day and they can start some kind of just some some real projects now um but i often find if you go to the council and ask them ask them for something it's going to cost you so much more time in the short mid and long term than if you to go and tell them what you're going to go and do and then say give me this and yeah whatever it is that you need to get for it I'll, I'll, I'll pay it and then you know your quantifiables and then you can kind of figure that into a practical kind of business scenario um to actually kind of like impl implement those those ideas that you have um so yeah while, while we have a responsibility to shine a light on things i think we also have a further responsibility to act upon them ourselves as well very interesting i mean i've lost count of the number of uh, examples I have where uh, this fantastic incredible project is being presented and you t talk about how that began and it began with someone going oh just ask a silly question of somebody who might own this or something like that and then actually by asking the question and saying why can't I uh, you know people sort of they have a respect for things that they couldn't possibly ask that but by by, by going and asking and putting things to action things can can happen and uh, I wanted to throw in something myself as well, which was um, shining a light is, is one thing uh, and acting is very important. But I think also, you know, there are a great deal of fantastic councils out there, as well as the people that we 
fights against and fantastic people who are really under the cosh. You know, it's really tough out there. Um, and I think there's this sense of shining a light, but also creating levels, modeling kind of empathy and understanding where they are and what they're coming from as well as where you're coming from and which leads you to be able to ask the right questions and sort of empathize with the position that different people are in i think there's a there's a, there's a role in that kind of empathy rather than just this might be my view see what other people think rather you can't, can't just shake the cage you know because quite often that is important i don't don't say don't shake the cage but if we just say shout about it rather than kind of understanding where different people are coming from I'm, I'm not convinced that that is models the sort of future that we that, that, that we're looking for um uh, some great stuff around action I, i'm gonna just throw in one more provocation into all of this because it came out of this thing and i think often this is not talked about enough um it's a provocation i'm not saying i believe this by the way uh which is this you can't build an entire health system on relationships of mutual trust and respect. It's just too expensive, too risky and too inefficient. Or, you know, misses a whole load of things that we actually need to deliver for people. Um, I'm going to throw that in there because we talk a good game about how communities are the solution. Are they? Let's have a let's have a bit of a uh, uh, anyone got any perspective on that? Go on, Ruth. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely statement, Bob. It just it really strikes me clearly is you can't build one without it. What, what, what kind of system are you building that isn't based on uh, relationships, mutual trust and, and respect? What, what does anybody imagine would come out of a system, particularly relating to health, that isn't, doesn't have that, as its foundations and also you know it, it just kind of seems to leap to my mind that um it's kind of anything that doesn't have that right. is is likely to be more expensive more risky and more inefficient that would be my my comment for, for i just you know who would design a human system not right. built on trust and respect <laughs> Fair enough, Ruth. I, I don't disagree necessarily. One of the reasons I raise it is because you quite often hear conversations which say, you know, this is very nice, mutual relationships, respect, trust, community. But, you know, we've got some hard things we've got to deal with now. And actually we've got, you know, that if you build it all from there, it's too fluffy. right? Um, uh, Neil, but, but, sorry, it's gone, Ruth. Go on, I, I just it. it, it we shouldn't use I, I i struggle when we start to have those conversations and use words like fluffy they're not fluffy they are absolutely the bedrock of anything going forward if you look at what's going on now look at a test and trace system that is still malfunctioning x seven months beyond when apparently it was a state-of-the-art system no part of it is built on on trust, mutual, like nobody's using it, has that kind of understanding or commitment to it. We're making the best of a really bad deal. And it strikes me that it's been massively inefficient. It's been massively, you know, kind of expensive. And, and it's kind of, you know, the idea that we can build systems along the lines of, um, of, of a factory and, and, and um, you know, kind of units or widgets th that have no human attached to them and none of these relationships, and these relationships can be discounted or removed is an absolute, you know, it, it's a nonsense. And people trying to have those discussions without taking that into account, it, it's ill-founded for, for me. You know, we, we, have to, we have to fight back on what the argument is and what can be included in the conversation. Thank you, Ruth. Anyone else feeling strongly and passionate? It's doing what I wanted it to do, to create some provocation, which is exactly the purpose. Neil, you wanted to come in, then Johnny. Sure. I, I mean, I, I'm also conscious. I, I I talk a lot, so like sometimes I have to kind of like yeah be muted and <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't I don't want to take up too much airspace. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll keep this on brief because I could go on on it, but I'll keep it very brief. Um, I, I think kind of a statement like that, uh, where it, it is very absolute, using kind of 
words and terminology which which are absolute which um i i think are quite are quite violent really kind of they kind of prevent kind of using it to come come forwards um you know, it is too expensive and it is it's it's telling us something which is actually an opinion it's telling us like you know these are facts when they're not it's just someone's opinion because they don't know or don't can't see how it could be sold um i think there's kind of so much more value in kind of collective action uh, i think we really need to kind of <laughs> learn kind of from from one another this is kind of where all you know, it's a combination of our experiences so surely the greater kind of um uh, ability to take all those experiences in is where we kind of find our solutions and there's, there's one kind of there's one kind of uh, statement and i can't remember who either came up with this if it was anyone um but or even where i heard it but um i i, I always try to try to um uh respond to ideas or kind of uh, things with uh um, with an answer of yes, if you think about this, 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 and kind of if you address all these considerations, like hey, you have a great idea, well, yeah, that's great, do it. If, you know, and that would be awesome if you consider all these things. But so much of the time, kind of the response is always like, well, no, because of this, or because of this, or because of this. And it's it's a lack of imagination on the person listening to just because they can't think of a solution that they kind of downplay and kind of shoot down all other kind of ideas and i think it's a such a, a violent way to, to to approach things and it's it's you know society and capitalism certainly has has built us up into this kind of competition of like if i can't think of a way to do it then surely it's not possible um when um it's it's a really kind of dangerous mentality to have um so yeah i think i would encourage everyone to have a really kind of like oh, someone's telling me a dream or an idea they have, like, yeah, well, yeah, well, I can see all these problems, but I'm just going to give you the benefit without your thought of them. And, and yeah, be consider those things. And if so, then great. <laughs> um, sorry, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> That's great, Neil. Johnny, you wanted to ch jump in as well. I did. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, this is, you know, maybe not very exciting, or it could be quite exciting, is that um, the, the, the NHS has a really fantastic place in our culture. It just has this place. And yet, uh, it, it's a bit shit. Um, I don't know. If, you know, people really know how it's. You know, it's it's designed for the you know post-war world, and it's and people love it, and they've grown up loving it, and it's a, it's an institution that matters. Uh, and yet, it does it very poorly, and it could do an awful lot better. Um, because it, it's you know anybody that's experienced it knows it's a, you know it's it doesn't really work terribly well. Um, and yet, you know, they will talk about the the fantastic service they've had by really loving, caring staff, and and all that. You know, all that's true. But as an institution, it's got a lot. Uh, wrong with it uh, many things wrong with it in different in many different ways including it's uh you know it has it's kind of you know the hospital system itself is a vehicle for which demands throughput um so it doesn't it isn't geared around a um a tackling health inequalities and preventative approach in the very very first place so it actually you know it's a um there is a word for it isn't it uh which i can't remember damn it um iatrogenic is it iatrogenic anyway where um the, the the healthcare system actually causes illness um uh, and, and it's uh, but through no deliberate you know um you know somebody deliberately trying to corrupt us but it but it's the core you know it's um it's it just represents a different worldview than one in which is people centered um that is looking at those basic building blocks of of um of of health, you know tackling health inequalities that were the the, the foundations of, of of health um you know we if we don't address all those other things whether it be housing fresh water um you know um, and you know those such basic principles and build on those then we're always going to have this uh, terrible thing you know, it's, the, it's the it's the whole that whole picture of um trying to hoik as many bodies out of the river as you can instead of stopping them falling in much further upstream it's that's and, and that's always going to be a failure so the further upstream you go, the more bodies you can save, and actually, you know, you can have fun swimming if you go in far enough up there, rather than <laughs> rather than have putting out the sick and drowning and dying at the other end. It's just which you can't, you can never do properly. There you go. I just thought I'd have a go at the pop at the NHS and the system. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm just gonna and I see you come in a minute, Ian. Um, Suzanne, I've just seen you said you you need to to leave us. Um, any final words, any sort of little goodbyes before you say anything you want to add? Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you very much for sharing. And I've just, like I said, really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, I'm being called elsewhere earlier than I thought. Um, I hope to join again soon. Yeah, be great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, 
I'll move on to Ian, and, and I just want to thanks very much, Suzanne. Take care. Bye. Um, I move on to Ian. What I want to do for the, uh, as we enter the last sort of 20 minutes or so um, after we've heard from Ian, is that this is also a bit, we, we we've explored some of the things. I put in a, 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 what I knew would create a bit of a provocation, which is good. And so I'm glad we got some of that stuff out as a result. Um, but I want to talk about, bring it back to the purpose of these kind of conversations, which is about getting stuff off your chest and supporting each other. So given all the things we've framed after Ian's gone, are there things people want to share and discuss that they're working on with, you know, around community leadership that, that, that they, they feel they would like to get some kind of thought on, given the framing that we've had so far? So, Ian, I'll come to you first, and then we'll go around and see if people have got anything they want to bring to the group for, for any sort of, um, you know, a bit of, bit of peer support. Go in. OK, uh, so I guess it's just building on what people said just now about the kind of uh, it's, it's almost like the responsibility that you take on as a community builder, community leader. So um, I, I remember Peter McFadden actually saying uh, the thing about Froome is it, it's great, but we don't have to decide about who lives and dies. So and so it feels like sometimes when we are asking to be uh, take on some responsibilities and uh, take some actions, you kind of do wonder where I wonder where I'm happy to be in Johnny's sort of where on the riverbank am I happy standing? Uh, because uh, yes, I'd dearly like to everyone to be at the beginning making a better food system, which means that people don't get really that sick because they eat well like wealthy people do. And the only thing that makes you die tends to be excess rather than just what's going in your body. Um, but COVID showed me that it's fucking scary when suddenly you have to decide whether the decision you make about who walks into your pub or not, you might kill them. And so we had conversations about, okay, we might kill them, but then they might die in their houses unless we go and knock on their doors. And the reason that we're prepared to take those uh, risks or, or, or actions is that you know their name. So that's where the sort of community comes in is you actually know their name and you'd be devastated to either kill them or have them die uh, because you didn't go and check whether they ate the food you delivered for them. So it is a kind of really, and, and that's when I sort of, I have sort of respect and uh, uh, I, I think hard about when I'm criticizing council offices is sometimes they kind of do have those decisions in, in certain councils and it's pretty scary. So, so yeah, there's, there's some, I, I agree that um, it, it has to be human, et cetera, but they, they, there comes this scary moment where you think, shit, I, God, I really don't want to make that decision. And that's that's not easy. So that's kind of what I've been thinking about. That's, Ian. that's really helpful. Um, so who wants to build either build on that or some of your own things that you'd like to just kind of share or get any kind of views on? Um, uh, at all. Reef, do you want to build on what you're just talking about, um, the meaningful understanding of risk? I don't know if that's something you're wrestling with or thinking about as well. Oh, sorry, because I thought I was on mute. So if you've heard dogs barking... Or oh, no, I haven't. I just saw you type in the chat. Oh, so, yeah. brilliant. No problem. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think to, to some extent, I've got two things, Ian, from what you're saying about, you know, like it's a risk to live some people's lives are far more risky than others dependent on their postcode them um, their early childhood the levels of social injustice and the factors that are operating in their lives but i think you're right that we, and we need to be aware of the choices that we make so like covid's a risk but there's a lot of other risks that that people are dealing with and and sometimes you know covid's the the lower level one so i think kind of you know i'm mindful of that and i, I do work with some um mental health well-being um uh, charities and organizations where you know there's been really difficult decisions about what to operate when to keep doors open um one in particular never shut its doors just re refused to on the basis that some people were at higher risk of you know, taking their own lives or something terrible happening. And that was that was a higher risk than COVID um, was. 
So I, I think that's an important thing to for us all to be aware of. And I, and I like the fact that it's human and it's got a name on it. We should put names to, to everything that we're doing. We should attach it to a story and, and understand that it, it it's real. Um, I suppose that the, the extra point, and sorry, I don't want to take too much time, but the one that really is preoccupying me is is mental health. You know, this, um, you know, how we've come to understand and speak about it, how um, the biomedical model dominates our understanding, and it's and and you know, it's in so many cases is pretty much pure myth, um, and and how it sits at the intersection of a whole range of life factors and how can we reclaim people and normal human distress back to our homes, our neighborhoods and our our communities. Um, exactly, I think it was referred to in, in sort of physical health as well, the damage that's being done by not acknowledging that people are in distress. And that is, it's, it's perfectly, it's not okay. It's very normal and it, and it doesn't need to be um, treated the way it is. And we don't need to remove people in the way that we do or isolate them in the way that we do. Um, yeah, I think I might have rambled slightly, so forgive me. No, no, not at all. That's good, it built on that. Yes, Peter. Yes, oh, no, you have unmuted. Um, I wasn't going to say this, but I could be just follow straight on from Ruth, really. So I, um, I know I know I wasn't allowed job titles earlier, but if I was to have one, one of my job titles is that I run a, um, I'm a an undertaker, and and and, and so there's a similar. It's just to say off that, and and because it, it comes up so much, and it does. We spend a lot of time, I and my colleagues, talking about our society's completely in total inability to talk about death still. After all these years and all these workshops, and I mean, of course, there are, of course, it's not uh, true across the board, but, but unless we can come to see our uh, position on the planet as, as a short term thing and, and accept death within our communities, which links in so much to a lot of the decisions that have been made around Corona, we've got a, a major uh, challenge. And um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot to do. Uh, and again, there's opportunities that have come out of this whole um, Corona and uh, uh, out of the pandemic and out of um, you know, our realization of, uh, 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 of who has died within that. I mean, if it ends, then we'll be able to look at it and go, okay, so, so, so how did that happen? And, and look at that more in relation to our, our whole relationship with death. Thank you, Peter. Um, Joe, is there anything you want, uh, not forcing you to say anything, but just giving the opportunity for everyone to have the space. Did you want to say anything? No, I'm just really, really enjoying the um, thoughts and input of everyone. Um, I had, I did, I, when you first said, do you have something you'd like to bring? I did have something. Um, is that, is that okay? Because I want to, I don't want to cut across the conversations I subsequently had that were so fantastic. Um, but I was, I'm very interested in impact assessment. Uh, we're looking at it at the moment. At the, I've been really resisting doing the traditional kind of um, qualitative and quantitative work with your clients, building stories and then reporting on that, because that always feels a bit like scrabbling to prove my worth. And if I didn't believe what we were doing <laughs> had worth and purpose, you know, I, I wouldn't have devoted my life to it. So. Um, and we're and we're not so dependent on top-down funding um, to have to do that. However, I really, really do genuinely and authentically want to be brave enough to know we've been active for six years in a particular community, and we call them squillimeters within one square kilometer of, of community in a an, in a suburb of Exeter. I want truly to genuinely and bravely to know has it made any difference? Um, and what's the best way to know that? And I know it's not by interviewing everyone that we've worked directly with. What I want to do is talk to everyone within that square kilometer and just, just take it on the chin if none of them mentions us. <laughs> none of them reckons that there's anything there at all. People got reflection on what's genuine, authentic and brave impact assessment. Great question. Um, 
Ruth's got an idea, haven't you, Ruth? I can see. Go on, you start us off. Sorry, because it's the same. It's like Neil, you know, I, I can talk a lot. And I don't know, I've realised watching Zoom, I quite often do this. I'm clearly trying to stop myself from talking more. Um, but impact assessment and storytelling, I, think, I bet you everybody's got loads to say about it. My big things for that are um, multiple methods, mixed methodology, I think is the technical term, is that, you know, go for richness, go for colour and texture, especially with an organisation like yours. Um, don't presume that because they don't mention your name, you haven't made any, di <laughs> any difference. Um, let people tell their stories in whatever way seems right and, and I, people get really cross with me and, and that would definitely be defined as fluffy lang you know that I'm, I'm too fluffy because as a you have to let people talk in the way that they want to talk and I can't tell you what that's going to be right now um, it, it's literally about creating spaces for people to talk beyond the first five minutes and then let that open up and 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 I don't even like some people use the word interrogate I don't I don't like that it's like let it be a conversation let one side sort of change and shuffle the other in in turn in the way that we would speak maybe we would speak now or you would speak with your friends or your family whatever the issues would be and and then see you know see what emerges I think if you start my issue is it's a bit like hospital it exists to treat ill people, so it goes looking for them. Mm. Um, it's it's like if you start with what you want to get out, then you'll either get that or you won't get it. But if you can start with a more open agenda for impact, you're going to find out lots more. You'll find things about yourselves, but you'll find things about lots of other people that you'll also be able to share. Um, yeah, I, I can't, but but sort of individuals yeah. and stories. I just think. And their ideas of themselves, not not as a fixed story, but as a as a fluid kind of. I can tell my story in lots of different ways, and I'm going to be different tomorrow than I was yesterday. Thank you. I want to stop. <laughs> yeah, you, you're kind of talking about really good qualitative technique, and you know, I I completely hear that. I, I'm totally with you on that. What do you think about this idea that we we sample beyond the people that we've worked with? In, into the broader community and have you got um, examples where that's happened um, how do you how do you sample into a broader community to to get those you know authentic voices if anyone has, has got that Ruth does then anybody else no but I, I mean, you, you, you can typically use, redirect through the people that you have worked directly with and move into their next layers. But you can also do it by just randomly selecting in your area, like who else is doing stuff. And you can do that in any way and just do a Google search and then literally use their contact details and, and open up a conversation. But I think what's really valuable is if you're going to do this, going forward is it isn't a bolt on it's just the way that you you operate but yeah i am oh. gonna shut up now that's all right um oh johnny i just wanted to catch him before he left but he just had to to leave um I, you just give me an idea actually joe as well that we're, we're creating this kind of list of networks with specific um things uh, and questions that come up and everyone knows someone I, i've got a few thoughts to share with you afterwards um uh, on your question as well so i think it's great that that we raise that the, the one thing I wanted to, 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 to do just for 10 minutes um, before we finish here is, is I've taken away quite a few things that I wanted to kind of summarize on this call and see what other people have, have taken away from it. Um, but also at the end, once we stop recording to get a little bit of feedback on the format and, and how to improve this uh, uh, for the future. But the key things that kind of came from this discussion to me is that um, we as community leaders, we're often told we need to grab this moment. There's always the moment. This is the moment. This is the moment. To, this is the you'll never have another opportunity. And, you know, COVID is, the, is, is I, I agree, is a big moment, but it is one that we're, we're told a lot of that we have to grab. And that can create an awful lot of pressure on your shoulders. We've got to grab the moment. So what I was going to sort of say is that the, the thing that kind of came from here is that it is our it, it is a moment to shine a light 
it is a moment to take action as well as signing a light and it is a moment to create empathy in the way that we you know ask for those actions but we also have to be realistic where are we on the bank where are we comfortable being on the bank as ian put it um and you know within that that context let's just be realistic about how we model what we need to be how we shine a light how we take action but be realistic about you know where we're comfortable and where we're prepared to be that's kind of what's going around my head anyway um, uh, 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 around this pressure that i feel many community leaders feel sort of guilty for not having done enough to make the case you know um which i think to a certain degree is a good drive but it could also be quite a destructive one um Anyone else got any final thoughts, either on what I've said or or, or um, reflections on on the conversation? Um, Neil, um, uh, I was going to come in earlier a little on the um, mental health side of things. Um, and it's something that I mean we were t touched on all, all kind of bits, um, and Abby touched on earlier as well about kind of how much do you, uh, how much of yourself do you kind of invest um and to what detriment is that um and um maybe I'll, I'll just a very brief uh a bit of my own kind of experience in that too um a couple of years ago um i i myself was was uh had um some mental health um difficulties um and i guess a lot of that was to do with kind of how much i was investing into the the community organizations i was running and um um, I, I got asked to do a publication for like a, an article for um, uh, what's it called <laughs> for a social enterprise magazine. I can't remember the name of it. Escapes me now. Um, um, and, and so I did. And, and at the end, they asked me if I wanted to um, have my name put in it um, because some people want, didn't want their name there, especially when it's talking about mental health and kind of admitting that publicly as well. Um, and, and kind of my answer was that well yeah leave my name in but i know that there's going to be consequences but we have to kind of take those risks because otherwise all, all the kind of like all of this is kind of in in vain at least you know if if we're not kind of open and honest about kind of the risks that that are very real uh, to us and, and other people like us um and everyone else as well then it kind of propagates kind of like this kind of um scaremongering and uh and, and the issue of of shame and things around around mental health um Unfortunately, it, it did have quite severe consequences, um, and um, I was scapegoated for many, many things, uh, which was not very nice. Um, but you know, I, I kind of stand by my kind of decision to, to uh, be quite open about it. Um, and from that, you know, kind of there's, there's lots of kind of rebuilding kind of kind of happening too. Um, and you know, those conversations are people feel far more safer to have vulnerable conversations with me, which is which is great. Um, and I guess through through COVID as well, there's obviously there's kind of a greater impact on people, and especially those who want to kind of, you know, how much do you do? And as well, you do all, all that you possibly can. And a lot of it may well be to uh, your detriment. I, I'm, I'm aware of a number of people who have kind of gone above and beyond and, and, and died um, uh, from, from whether it's mental health conditions or, or, or COVID itself. Um, and I think it's really important to to remember um, kind of why we do these things in the first place, um, and that, that there's a there's a really good there's a, there's a book that I am very very uh, fond of called uh, The Road Less Travelled. Uh, it's by um, M, M. Scott Peck. Uh, it's quite an old book now, so um, be forgiving on some of the language it uses. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things that it kind of promotes is um, an understanding of what love is. Um, and firstly, it, it, it says that love is two things. It's uh, both an intention and an action. Coincidentally, the two things that you need to be a good citizen is also an intention and an action uh, to, to participate and to, to, to act, inform yourself and to act upon it. Um, and it gives, it gives the, um, the definition of love, uh, not to be fluffy about it, but a definition of love is um, what the, um, the will to extend oneself for the nourishment of one's own or another's spiritual growth. Spiritual being in context of the book, an acceptable term to use. Um, <laughs> and essentially that is kind of like, I will do everything I can for you so long as it's not a detriment to me. And I will do everything I can for myself so long as it's not a detriment to you and everyone else. And it talks about this thing of, um, of it being symbiotic. So 
it cannot be uh, a loving act if it is to my detriment. Um, you know, uh, um, every time we kind of like uh, take uh, make a do something for someone else's benefit, um, you know, we extend ourselves, we we grow. It's also an act of self evolution, and it makes us more capable to be able to do more and more. And if we're constantly defeating ourselves by the actions that we take in the support of others, then it actually reduces the amount that we can contribute. So I think it's really important to recognize that um, being active citizens in what we do, it's, 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 it's a vital measure to be able to take care and sustain ourselves. Um, and if we're not doing that, then it's not informing other people in a way which actually is productive to creating change. Um, Thank yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> no, I, I picked up on a lot of stuff there and, and really sharing some lovely things in the, in the chat. But I, I agree that a lot resonated from that, you know, taking action and being brave. And I applaud you for the for the bravery. It sounded like that was a, a, a big task. So, so um, amazing. But I do agree that, that this kind of sense of we've got to be brave and stand up and model what we want to believe in. But we also have to be, you know, not, not, um, I think I'd sort of taking away particularly. Now, what we do um, for others should also not be the detriment to, to ourselves. Otherwise, it's not an act of love in the way you described. I think that's really important for community leaders as a message to hear. So, so thank you for that um, and for bringing the word love, as Ruth said, into the conversation, um, which is brilliant. Uh, uh, Peter. Thanks. Um, and, and that last bit of conversation, particularly, I really, I really liked what you say on, uh, said, Neil. Incidentally, and I, and I absolutely um, agree. You know, it, it should just be, it shouldn't be so difficult, should it? And the idea that you had to make a decision that then, as to whether it might have repercussions, what you were writing, putting your name on, and then it did. I mean, cr that's just crap, isn't it? That we're still at that position in, in at this age. So it made me think in relation to the title of this. This set of conversations, uh, Bob. It's like so. For me, it's like, how does cutting the crap become something that we can do? You know, more white, more. How can it just? How can we move to where it's something that that um, that is just something that we do, and people like Ian become normal? Um, I don't know you, Ian, at all, really, but so that's probably deeply insulting. But you know, it's like what you were saying before about that's what you want to be able to do. Well, you you know, you should be able to, and people should be able to hear what you have to say. And then um, kind of deal with it if it's problem problematic, but but you know, and, and move on. And I don't know how we've. Um, it feels so annoying that we're still at this point, and that this you know there's three, four, five, six, seven, eight of us having this conversation rather than eight hundred thousand. Um, and uh, so I'd be really interested in to how this group could move from being a small group of people who have a really interesting discussion to to something which is kind of going. Why do these things not? What stops them just being the norm? Why can't we talk about, you know, all the all the different things that we've talked about today? And and what you know, why does Neil have that problem? And you know, and of course, all this links in anyway with lots of other stuff. <laughs> that would be my thought as to where this might go. Interestingly, thanks, Peter. Um, Ian. Yeah, so, uh, just on what Peter said, there is it can't it just sort of it, it it just protects the things as as they are, and it's. Uh, I, I think five years ago, I kind of maybe felt a bit differently and just, you know, this is how it is. This is how you speak to funders, play the game. You'll eventually be rewarded. You can do your little thing in your little corner and feel quite proud. And that is a good thing. And lots of good things happen because people do it that way. But on the other hand, it, it, climate change feels to me like this thing that says, there just isn't time to make this incremental change to the way we do things. So what are the things that you can say or do or shout or, or sneak into the, into the processes that, set, that say, stop pissing around and let's move forward more quickly? That, that feels like the thing. It's just every time I get into this sort of council thing, you're just like, ah, oh, no. Isn't there another way around this? And then sometimes there just isn't. They, they have the thing and, and somehow, how the hell do you res, wrestle it from them? Um, and, and maybe sometimes you just gotta be a bit meaner about it and a bit more impatient about it. A bit, 
sustained impatience someone we know yeah. would uh w- would say yeah yeah um, uh, uh, ruth and then joe but i just want to say one thing as i my, my kind of experience of these sort of conversations is that small groups of eight there are eight hundred thousand people talking about this in small groups of eight and and in a way part of the job is is having these discussions sharing them and connecting and I, i'm really interested in what you said around that peter about how we talk work with stir because that's a the whole network of people and this group and other networks to sort of begin to continue to have these discussions and keep them alive um but that's given me a lot of a lot of food for thought and us uh, vicky and abby to think about um Ruth and then Joe, um, just a, a minute or so each before we um, let people uh, take five minutes break before they're two thirty. Talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, a couple of the big things, obviously, are power and institutions, and then how do we counter that? What do we do? So I think things like Extinction Rebellion are an absolutely brilliant example of how you know, kind of tiny little you, sorry, my dog's trying to type, Um, how we can change the the world, but do it in, you know, kind of micro pockets and neighbourhoods and houses. And and I I do think there might be a case for, and I've I've talked about it in a few places and heard it, of if we share common values, if we can all agree around, this, this is what we believe. We actually, when we say it, we believe in love. That's it's, a, it's an absolutely fine word to use, and we shouldn't be ashamed of using it in any way, shape, or form. Um, and you know, can we form an alliance so that when somebody needs something, or when we're up against an institution, and when nobody's listening, a whole you know a whole raft of us can actually come together and offer support and and apply pressure and say, do you know what? it's like it would really be better if you if you did it this way or how about we try something different this time thank you Ruth. Thank you, Ruth. and joe final word yeah I, I i agree with everyone i've thoroughly enjoyed the discussion and huge thanks bob for uh, letting me come along for the chat um i'm i'm kind of torn between paul paul hawkins um blessed unrest where there's billions of grassroots organizations all doing socially engaged work, but they're not connecting. There isn't a man in a suit who's sort of pulling it all together in a connected movement, but they're there. And, you know, when I first came across that idea that actually we weren't alone, that there are all of these organizations globally doing extraordinary work. um, And maybe it was okay for them to not be connected but then I'm just listening to Ruth to say, you know, if we were through our values, could we bring more pressure to bear? So I don't have the right answer to that. I'm still got a foot in each camp. I think let us all just grow, bubble up from grassroots up in disconnected, glorious messiness. Um, or do we try and do the connection? I don't know. Well, I don't know either. Um, do both I quite like that idea yeah. I mean it's been fascinating I really enjoyed the conversation um, I'd love to get your thoughts or feedback on any of the questions we've just raised or how we turn this kind of forum uh, in, in, in and grow it because I think the the columns I've had lots and lots of comments from the columns and the kind of the last stir to action event that more spaces like this are really useful um, but also how do we make them greater than the sum of their parts as do, do both as you say so love to hear your ideas or thoughts on that and then any straight up feedback on on this conversation and 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 how we manage future columns but um all i have to say is uh thank you so much for uh, sharing that with me it's given me a lot to think about um and uh uh, it's great to chat with like-minded people on on forums like this so have a lovely afternoon all and thank you for your time